wanted the best, you've got the best podcast. The hottest, hottest. podcast in the world. In the world. The Chris Voss Show, the preeminent podcast with guests so smart you may experience serious brain bleed. Get ready, get ready. Strap yourself in. Keep your hands, arms, and legs inside the vehicle at all times because you're about to go on a monster education roller coaster with your brain. Now, here's your host, Chris Voss. Hi, folks. It's Voss here from the Chris Voss Show.com. The Chris Voss Show.com. Hey, we're coming here with another great podcast. We certainly, certainly appreciate you guys tuning in. Thanks for joining the Chris Voss Show family, family that loves you but doesn't judge you. But please do clean your room. <laughs> anyway, guys, uh, the uh, we have another great author on the show with us today. In the meantime, you know the drill. Go to youtube.com for chess Chris Voss. Uh, see everything we're reading and reviewing at goodreads.com for chess Chris Voss. All the groups on Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. See the big group on uh, LinkedIn of 132,000 people and our LinkedIn newsletter that's just killing it. LinkedIn's really becoming a thing over there. So we're excited to announce my new book is coming out. It's called Beacons of Leadership, Inspiring Lessons of Success in Business and Innovation. It's going to be coming on October 5th, 2021. And I'm really excited for you to get a chance to read this book. It's filled with a multitude of my insightful stories, lessons, my life, and experiences in leadership and character. I give you some of the secrets from my CEO entrepreneur toolbox that I use to scale my business success, innovate, and build a multitude of companies. I've been a CEO for, uh, what is it, like uh, 33, 35 years now. We talk about leadership, the importance of leadership, how to become a great leader, and how anyone can become a great leader as well or order the book wherever fine books are sold uh today we have an amazing young lady on the show she has written the book how to talk to your boss about race speaking up without getting shut down why bone uh hutchinson is on the show with us today she'll be talking about her uh experience and everything that she's done before she is the ceo and founder of ready set and the author uh of how to talk to your boss about race and it's a diversity and inclusion training firm, firm that she runs that helps tech giants, political leaders, media outlets, and Fortune 500 companies speak more productively about race, racism, in fact, and turn talk into action. To date, Ready Set has worked with hundreds of companies around the world to build, manage, and grow diverse teams. In a former life, prior to founding Ready Set, she worked as an international labor and human rights lawyer for nearly a decade. Welcome to the show. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. Thank you for having me. I'm super excited to be here. Good, good. Did I get the pronunciation of your first name correct? Almost. It's Wyvon. <laughs> Wyvon. I'm sorry. Yeah. My apologies. Okay. I, I throw so much energy into the beginning of the show, the brain goes woohoo right out the window. So welcome to the show. Uh, tell us uh, your plug so people can find you on the interwebs. You can find me on the interwebs at yvonne.com. So y-v-o-n-n-e.com. I was lucky enough to be able to snag that. And uh, you can find my company online at www.thereadyset.co. Um, and also you can find me on Twitter, Hutchmachuch. I picked my handle before I knew how Twitter works, so it's long. And uh, yeah, that's usually where, you, and I'm also located on LinkedIn um, and people use that. Well, I use it less well, but I'm on there. Uh, you just look for my name. There you go. There you go. So what motivated you want to write this book? Yeah. I mean, there are, there are a couple of things that, um, that, that motivated the book. You know, I was approached to write it uh, in the summer of 2020 when we were kind of all waking up to the racial justice movements that were happening in the country. Um, and, you know, I was, asked to write a book to really help equip people to have difficult conversations. But I wanted something that was like about more than that, right? Because I, so often I feel like we stop at the idea of conversation. And I just like reflecting back to, on my work, I, I, I so often got the question, how do I as an individual change a system? So in a way, the book almost became this kind of Trojan horse for thinking about individual action to change systems. And in the book, we talk specifically about race and the culture of racism, but this could be any kind of system that you're within, right? How do you as an individual engage that, 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 that systemic change? That was the book that was interesting to me. Mm -hmm. That was the book that I decided that I wanted to write. And so that's, that's why I wrote it. And I'll say one more thing is that if you read the book, it's kind of half how to guide, 
half mentor, uh, me memoir, sorry, half memoir with like a sprinkling of profanity throughout it. And I wanted to write, <laughs> I wanted to write a book that was true to myself that had that shit in it, see, <laughs> because that's go. how I talk. And I just didn't want to write a traditional business book. You know, uh -huh. I wanted something that felt open and honest and didn't feel like somebody on high kind of telling you what to do. Yeah. So, yeah. So is the book a good way to to help people uh, get inclusion, uh, different principles and stuff into into a company that maybe hasn't embraced that yet? Yeah, I mean, in the book, I talk to people about how to think about you know culture change, and and for me, it's not just about inclusion. Like that's part of it, right? But okay. when I work with companies, quite often, you know diversity, equity, inclusion are symptoms of something much deeper going on, whether that's mm. inequitable systems of management, toxic cultures, whatever. And so the, the the book is essentially how do you equip yourself to have a tough conversation in this case, particularly around racism, which is uniquely hard for some people. And then how do you think about following that up with action? Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, so, I mean, there's, there's definitely some best practices and if somebody read it, they could, they could walk away with some tips for, for how to get started in, in, in doing that. So what sort of environment, so it's different, like toxic environments or stuff. Uh, is, is it, uh, advice that on how to get a racist policy set up or racism policy yeah. set up? So, racist policy set up. <laughs> hopefully not a racist policy set up. We don't want <laughs> they you already, to do that. Let's say they already have one and it's time to change yeah. their racism. <laughs> Um, so, you know, the book starts with this premise, Chris. It's, mm -hmm. it, um, I, I say that there's no place historically in our country where race is more implicated in, than in the workplace. Like, if you look at how my people came to this country, we came as slaves to do free labor, right? And if you look at the stereotypes that are associated with us now, they date back all the way to that, that condition. And the same could be said for a lot of other demographic groups, the workplace has always been segregated. We've always been told that based on our identities, there were certain jobs we could do and we couldn't do. And so, you know, I say we, we approach um, this challenge with that in mind, right? That we're trying to kind of undo the histor this historical thing. And, you know, I start off the book by saying, if you're going to change a culture, because it's not just about policy. So it's about how people treat each other. You know, I talk a lot about who does well in an organization. So if you go into a company and all the people at the top look one way and all the people who are entry level look another way, you know, even though people aren't wearing hoods, you probably have some racism in that company, right? Yeah. If you go to a company and, you know, people are getting shut down in meetings or, you know, people are, you know, we, we call it microaggressions. You know, every time a black woman comes in, they're talking about her hair or like how she speaks, you know, you you, you've, you've got that problem. And so in order to fix it, you don't just write a policy. You have to work on individual behaviors. You have to think about the overall culture. You have to think about the support structures you put in place to, to help those people. And it also starts with a conversation. And my book is like, how do you get ready to have that conversation? You know, yeah. and in, in my book, I, I, I say a lot, you know, I say the conversation is a starting point. And it's really tempting to think that these skills are innate to us that we're born knowing how to be equitable, but we're not. If anything, the opposite is true, right? Mm -hmm. From the time I came in the world, people were telling me stereotypes about other people, right? Mm -hmm. I saw folks in certain positions and folks in other positions. I internalized that. And we're mm -hmm. all the same way, right? And so we have to str be strategic when we think about how do we undo all of the things that we've internalized. And the book tries to to get us there. So I'll, 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 I'll pause after I answer. Sorry, I'm long winded. I'll pause after I, I, I say this. Um, you know, the book essentially has this sort of framework for action where it says, you know, you start, if, if the conversation is a jumping off point, we start with giving, getting you ready to have that. So first, understanding yourself, your power, your identity, your position in an organization, in, in the same way if you were going to do an organizational strategy, right? You, you mm -hmm. position, understand your position in that way and think about how to leverage your power. And then most importantly, I always tell people this, understand who your allies are. When mm -hmm. we look at any sort of movement in a, in, in a social movement, civil rights movement, labor rights movement, workers' rights, it's all happened as part of a collective. Never has it been an individual. And we're taught, like history teaches us about Martin Luther King and Rosa Parks and Susan B. Anthony, but it doesn't teach us about the machines that were behind those people, right? So mm -hmm. you got to start building your machine 
figure out how to get people closer to your cause, how to build trust with your allies, how to work in coalition. Talk about that. And then you got to figure out how to set up this conversation and have it be that jumping off point and position it for success. And then you have to plan for failure. Or if it doesn't go the way you want, what Mm -hmm. are you going to do then? So Mm -hmm. we kind of talk through people, talk through that framework in the book, in the book for people and hopefully set them up to have that conversation, but also to really see holistic action. Yeah, that's really interesting. We had someone on last week who, uh, uh, Gal Beckman, who wrote the book, The Quiet Before and the Unexpected Origins of Original Radical Ideas. And he was talking Mm -hmm. about how uh, a lot of times, you know, we, we do these social things where we're just like, I'm going to hashtag this and, and yeah. then that's my contribution or that's how far the thing goes. And people don't realize you've got to build, like you said, the whole systems and the everything around it to support it and really move it forward and keep it to keep its momentum going mm-hmm. and stuff. Um, what's, what's, uh, what's one of the biggest problems you see in companies today that they're really, that they're really challenged with? Is it, is it they're stuck in tropes or they're stuck in mindsets? Uh, they, they're not self-aware maybe of, of what they, what they think? I think part of it's self-awareness. I'll say in this moment, cause I think, it, you know, I could generalize across time and actually, I'm not sure that's as helpful as saying what are companies dealing with in this particular moment yeah. um, that's unique. And I think we saw a lot of momentum with the Black Lives Matter movement, the racial justice movement in 2020, and this sort of sea change where companies are really coming out in support of these causes right and and like they have some big goals you know like adidas is like let's tackle white supremacy and you're like okay adidas you know what i mean but like like you know we you had companies who were like you know making these commitments and then what we've seen two two years later is that energy is tapered off and i think um when i think about the challenge of this moment it is maintaining that momentum and navigating the backlash that's inherent to this work. And I think for, for those of us who are new to, to fighting racism, and there, I say that without judgment, you know, like, you know, you, you talk about this as a show with no judgment. I say that without judgment. Like we all come to this fight when we come to this fight, right? For those who came to the fight then, um, I, I think that they underestimated how deeply entrenched some of the stuff was and how hard it would be. You know, we're taught that if we're simply aware of racism, we're going to stop doing it. And it just doesn't work that way. And so when that didn't work, you know, I think the momentum tapered off for a lot of people. And there was a question of, well, what does systemic change look like? How do I think about fighting backlash within my company? Oh, by the way, the world is also falling apart around me as I'm making these commitments to racial justice. We still have a pandemic, these geopolitical tensions, like that are, you know, so, so I think trying to figure out how to sustain progress having identified it is probably the biggest challenge that I see organizations wrestling with today. Do you have to identify if your boss, I mean, because you put this in the title, do you have to identify if your boss watches Fox News? <laughs> I mean, I, I would say it's probably a waste of your time. I mean, so, I mean, yeah. like, in the thing, like, I don't, and neither should you, like, it's one thing to understand your boss's motivations in the sense of, like, what is gonna like get them going what what do they energize by at work like what how does their brain work but it is so hard to figure out if a person is like inherently racist or like whatever in their off time and it's quite often you just end up spinning your wheels so and then you know in the book i kind of say we focus on actions and the impact of those actions so yeah. if your boss is like giving all of the great assignments to white people you know like the white dude's name chad from his fraternity then like you should that, like that's the action you should focus on and then focus on the impact of the team okay. if your boss is engaging in microaggressions you should focus on that but it could also be that your boss is in a position to enact systemic change that you want to see so maybe yeah. your boss can help expand the hiring pipeline or a sponsor an ERG or, you know, in this case, there's no particular behavior that your boss is engaged in that's problematic because you need to get your boss on your side so that you together can change a culture. I talk about both of those scenarios in the book. Yeah. What's an ERG? Employee resource group. Sorry, I use slang because I'm no just like problem. so 
deep in it, but um, employee resource groups, they've been around since about the 1990s. They're um, comprised of like employees from similar identities and their allies. So it started with black employees at IBM, but now today they're, you know, parents, LGBTQIA plus employees, um, you know, Hispanic employees, what you know, women, ERGs, and, you know, they do everything from helping recruit to coming up with networking, programming, um, doing like those affinity group months. It just sort of depends on what their mandate is, but they're generally thought of supportive systems for employees for particular backgrounds. Cool. That's very interesting. Yeah. yeah it, Fox News is taking us back the other way. I don't watch yeah. it, but I when I go to the gym, they have it on the gym locker room and they are really obsessed with Black Lives Matter. Like they... <laughs> Like it, it, they're like every time I go in there, there's there's it must be the time of night I go, but they're they are obsessed with Black Lives Matter, and I'm like, uh, are we covering what you know all the all the Trump legal things that yeah. just happened? Like last week was like amazing, all the stuff that happened Trump legal wise, and I, you know I, I'm sure they're diverting, but, but you know when I one of the problems I have, I thought I was pretty, uh, you know I didn't have any racist sort of tendencies or hidden prejudices or or tropes stuck in my head and after trump was elected and i just sat there going what the fuck went on and what yeah. is white nationalism and i started reading about the tropes and the stuff that the white nationalists were using and and i started seeing the coded language that you know yeah. trump and and then we're using and you know you know culture and different different code words and i'm i started going holy shit you know i gotta make sure i don't <laughs> use these code words i yeah. didn't even I mean, you know, these code words are thing. And, you know, we've had so many great authors on um, Jesus and and uh, John Wayne. I grew up idolizing John Wayne, watching John Wayne movies. I had no idea the sort of feed that that was giving me of the, you know, the American ideal of, of this shitty on the Shining Hill and the 450 years of yeah. all of our stupid shit that this country's done. It's horrific. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, it's there's a lot to unpack. I've been in different clubhouse yeah. rooms where we talked about this. I don't know if you've ever been on Clubhouse. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, I've had a whole group of people, you know, sitting around and it's just amazing how many of us still don't get it. Like, yeah, yeah. It, and we'll still be hung up on like certain tropes, like some, this guy will have a trope over here and you're like, no, no, that's not right. And, you know, there's, there's like these little teeny things that you don't realize until you've really done some research and, and tried to kind of cleanse yourself of all this stuff. Yeah, well, I think, like, in my mind, when we let go of the tropes, then we have to accept an, a really uncomfortable truth. Yeah. And it's not, you know, I, I think I've had to do that work, too, right? There are tropes that we're, I was taught as a Black person about Black people that I have to actively work to undo, like tropes around underachievement, or if only we just place more of an emphasis on education or absent black fathers. These are all like empirically uh, disprovable tropes, right? But we're taught that because if those things are not true, what else is true that makes the outcome the way it is, right? Yeah. And that's the kind of, that's the scary question, right? Like if black people are graduating from college at like you know, incredible numbers, and they are, and graduate school, disproportionate to the share of the population, mind you, really? then what does it mean if we're not getting the jobs? What does it mean if we're disproportionately impoverished? Yeah. I mean, something else is going on, and we personally, we can't personally responsible, you know, be responsible for our way out of this, right? It yeah. becomes much bigger and harder to navigate. Um, but yeah, I feel you on that. I, I think it's like a process of unlearning because we're just steeped in, in them. Yeah. I mean, everything that James Baldwin ever wrote or said, you can literally lift it off of the uh, 1950s, 1960s, yeah. when he was there. You can literally just go, yep, yeah, welcome to Put it right there. Put it right it's here. Still true. Yeah. You, you know, and, and uh, I, a few of his things ring true. He's like, when, when is it finally, when are you guys going to finally get over this? You know, yeah. and, and uh, we still haven't. And, and it doesn't help that we have, like, you know, a, a political system that still plays on tropes. You can see the code words. Like, I've gotten really good now at seeing, I know who they're talking to and who they're talking about and against. And, yeah. you know, the them, the days and stuff. And some of them are the Democrats. Some are, some are uh, yeah. minorities. You know, it's, it's really interesting because, for me, the two parties have really become, the Democrats see the progression that someday white people will be a minority in this country in, what, 10 to 20 years? And the GOP seems really obsessed with the fact that they don't want that to happen. Of course, this is about power. This yeah. is about control. 
yeah. of money and government and everything else. And then I see a lot of people who are afraid and or shameful, you know, that they feel like, well, uh, once we're a minority, everyone will treat us as bad as we treated them. It's like, well, that's not necessarily true. And that's also not an excuse to keep treating people poorly. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. You know. Well, I'm I'm not gonna be nice to people. I should just keep being mean to people because if I don't, then they'll be mean to me someday. That's like a yeah. <laughs> that doesn't it doesn't make any sense. Yeah, I mean, I think it. You know, I it's so weird. I feel like also we kind of trick ourselves into thinking that like the GOP and the radical right and Democrats like that they've split the country more evenly than they have. You know, I look. I'm not. I'm not a super idealist, but I think. We have to, like, especially, like, those of us having public conversations own that there are a lot of people in this country who don't agree, white, black, Latino, whatever, with some of the stuff that the GOP is doing, whether it's abortion rights. And I'm, you know, in Texas right now, so you can, the trans bill that just came out, dude, it's, we could get Texas politics all day. We could talk Texas politics all day, yeah. but even like where I am, it's really easy to think, oh, you're, it's a red state. Everybody agrees with this. And no, what's happening is like small people, small number of people have like, are trying to rig up a system of minority power where they, you know, carve off portions of the population and target certain people and, and, and act like it is reflective of the will of the people. When in mm. fact, a lot of times it's not, you know? And so mm. I just, I, I totally agree with you. I think that public sentiment is a is a little bit more unbalanced than we are used to thinking about it being. Yeah. But yeah, yeah. And and I think people need to learn empathy. They need to listen to other people's stories. Like yeah. reading the book uh, Cast was one of the hardest books I've ever had to read. It took me a yeah. long time because I had to stop and sometimes just be heartbroken and just I, I have to stop reading this. I'm gonna just it's. But we have to read these things. We have to understand yeah. our history. And yeah. until we understand our history, we can't fix the future of stuff. And that's why um, uh, we had Andrea, um, I can't forget her name right now, on, on Monday. We were talking about racism with her book. And uh, I think it was white nationalism, racism, white nationalism. And, uh, you know, we, there's so many different problems. And it's so, people have to understand that the racism in our country is so built in from so many years between yeah. the neighborhoods we live in, not yeah. being close to each other, not understanding each other, not being integrated with each other, uh, having empathy for one another, our journeys and, and challenges, and just getting to know each other. I mean, our freeways yeah. are separate our neighborhoods and uh, redlining and things of that nature. So this is really important. And and I, I'm glad you're giving people a tool so they can they can have something to talk about because these are hard discussions to have. Yeah. 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 I think so. And I, and I think that you kind of hit the nail on the head with the fact that it is just so ingrained. Like there's never been an America without racism, yeah. you know, there could be, but there, you know, to, there hasn't been one yet. And I think it is so much of what we know, you know, and, 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 and when I, and when people ask me like, what is like an equity? I use the workplace. For me, the workplace is a microcosm, right? Of like, it's mm -hmm. where we spend the, the bulk of our time, but you can apply these systems elsewhere, you know, as well. But when people are like, what does an ideal state look like? Give me some great examples. You know, I have to say like, this is something we've actually never done before. <laughs> You mean, what do you think? Like, I'm, it's not like, <laughs> you know, like, I'm like, you know, it's like, I don't know, like, what Elon Musk does in his, but, you know, it's like trying to do that kind of innovative thing that, like, nobody has truly ever done before. We're not returning to, like, some safe and neutral default. That's actually exclusion. We're trying to build a thing for which there is no historical precedent in the lifetime of our country, right? And mm -hmm. that, I mean, and that, that's super tough to do. Or in the history of man, really, I think. Yeah. I mean, I think, well, I, I would push back on that, but really? I, <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, I'm not discounting the fact that we've, you know, had a really ugly four or 50 years, but yeah. I mean, man's, I think, struggled with race all of his life, hasn't he? All of, all of his history. Well, I think so. Uh, Ibram X. Kendi's book, Stamped from the Beginning, I found mm -hmm. this really useful. It's the history of racist ideas. Mm -hmm. And he actually kind of tracks it um, through time in a way that's interesting, starting with the slave trade. Now, I, I, I know that like we've always sort of had in-group, out-group bias, mm -hmm. but I don't think that has always been associated with race, even race as a classification. The fact that race itself is a social construct that we made up to justify 
certain economic and political goals, you know, that we could pinpoint to a certain period of time when we did at the beginning of the slave trade and colonial expansion and, and, you know, you know, and, you know, and, and now, and now bringing it up to date, I think, I don't think it was always this way. I think there was yeah. always distance and bias and infighting and all of that nasty stuff. I think it was based on different things. Um, but I think there was a world before racism and there can be a world after racism. Well, there you go. That's that makes sense. It, it's it's definitely something we need to do. What are some other tips or tricks that you have in the book that can help people? Um, so let me see. So I, I mentioned, you know, understanding yourself and your power. I think power is really important. We have a such a limited conception of power. Power is a binary. Either you have it or you don't. Mm -hmm. And I talk about um, social power, the power of influence. And I kind of think of power as like knobs on a stereo where you you can like you have different levels and different things that you can access. So thinking about the different different types of power you act you can access and how you and how you ex access those. Uh, I've talked about building your bench of allies and converting people one degree closer to your cause. I use a lot of social movement theory in the book as well. Um, and then uh, following things up with action. And I talk a little bit in the book also about how to navigate backlash and the myths associated with diversity, equity, and inclusion. We talked a lot just now about kind of the sort of code words that you have in the workplace, there are code words as well. And so I talk about how do you identify them and um, navigate them, right? So uh, one of the myths that we I talk a lot about is the pipeline myth, which drives me fucking nuts. Like the, the idea like, oh, we just can't find these talented people. When if you look at the data, um, people are not represented equitably in terms of like how, how graduate schools and, and uh, you know, their rates of graduating from university into the workforce. And then once they get into the workforce up the ladder, you know, people are just aren't represented equitably and it has a lot less to do with the pipeline than it does bias or the fact that this is in fact a global issue. It's not just a U.S. issue. Um, mm -hmm. And I think so uh, the U.S., like we fail ourselves when we think about civil rights as just a U.S. phenomenon. I say this is a former international human rights lawyer. It's very much a global issue. Um, and so, so, so I talk about that in the book. And then also, how do you navigate things like retaliation, backlash, that sort of thing? And then how do you know when to go? You know, the truth of the matter is a lot of times when people bring this up, especially if they do it alone, which I never advise, but inevitably somebody will, you know, they, they can be targeted for, for backlash, right? What do you do when that happens to you? And how do you know when to walk away? And, um, uh, you know, I talk through that. I, I think it's important to accept that sometimes we as individuals won't be able to change a system and we won't be able to change people. And sometimes our biggest lever of change is actually just to, to walk away. Yeah. Um, and then finally, I, I, I talk a lot about um, self-care too. Um, you know, the idea that we can't keep doing this work. And I, I mentioned earlier, I think what a lot of organizations struggle with is the sustaining the momentum piece we can't do that if we're tired and i don't know about you chris but like i've been watching the news all day today yeah. like and you know as somebody who's like to study disarmament somebody who's spent a lot of time in war zones like my heart is like breaking right now because of yeah. what's happening in the ukraine and so i'm like holding that and also like covid is still very much a thing i my whole family actually just recovered from covid because oh, my wow. little one caught it in daycare so, oh wow yeah. You know, so there's that. Um, there's, you know, I live in Texas and, you know, I have trans Every people who I love who are so fucking scared right now, yeah. you know? Yeah. Um, and so we have to hold all these things while still pushing for change in like the organizations that we depend on for our very livelihood. Yeah. So we just have to like take care of ourselves and, and, and know, you know, know when to hold them, know when to fold them, <laughs> know when to walk away and like know when to take a nap you know, and, and, and take care of yourself. I like that. I like this nap part. I'm 54. I, you have to take a nap. I yeah. Know. I take naps yeah. all the time. I love, I used to, a, I used to tease my dad about, uh, I mean, they were like, dad, you're always sleeping. He's like, someday you'll get it. And <laughs> you'll understand. Like, you'll you'll understand. understand. We used to tease him and now I'm paying for it. I'm also paying for the hair in the ears that I used to mock my grandfather about. Oh. Yeah. That's that stuff grows out of everywhere, except for your head, of course. Yeah. yeah. Um, 
So, but fortunately I got this, but no, this is really great. Let's, let's touch on uh, what you do. I was looking at your company's website, the ready set.co. Yeah. Tell us about what you do over there. I know you have an app and some other things. Yeah, we try to do, uh, which we do quite a bit. I, you know, we kind of have positioned ourselves as like the end to end people company. I think wherever an organization intersects with a human being or they intersect with each other, that's where we come into play. So simply put, we work with uh, organizations to train them. So like you said, at the top of our interview, you know, we do workshops and webinars with companies around things that relate directly to DEI, like, you know, anti-bias training, LGBTQIA plus inclusion training, disability inclusion training and accessibility training. But we also touch on broader topics that require you to just kind of weave equity in in order to do it well, like Mm -hmm. inclusive approaches to people management inclusive communication, inclusive hiring. So we do that, but we do quite a bit of consulting as well. So we provide advisory services with organizations. We do organizational assessments. We help them track their progress. We do do program design and development around DEI. We do individualized coaching. We write policies. We do all that stuff. And we also work with executive teams. We have a whole program, whole programs for executive teams. And like you said, we do have an app an individualized learning app. It's like a coach in your pocket, we say for DEI. And finally, we've just launched our talent attraction recruiting service. So now Mm. we're like helping you hire too. Like, so it's, you know, I know that's where a lot of companies are like, okay, you've given me all these principles, but like, where do we go and find people? We're doing that as well. Um, so we, like I said, we, we, we try to be pretty, pretty end to end with it. And we, we work with a large variety of organizations. Like I, like to say, we choose to partner with the organizations where we think we can have the most impact. So, you know, sometimes it's a political campaign. Sometimes it's a city government. Sometimes it's, um, you know, one of our partners is the Television Academy. They do the Emmy. Sometimes it's an entertainment organization. Sometimes it's a tech company. Um, but, you know, we're, 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 we're pretty open to those, to those partnerships. And we just really love to work where we think it's going to be interesting where we can be creative about this stuff because there's always space to try something new. We haven't gotten it right yet, like I said. And where we think our work is really going to be impactful. We don't just like do that whole corporate DEI thing. Let's like tap dance around the edges and like, here's your training and it feels a little weird and then you can walk away and forget it. We try not to do that stuff. We're like really about the the change. (laughs) I like the the executive and management coaching because, you know, you can make sure that the team you have around you is going to have any problems or cause any problems. You know, it, it's it's always interesting to me, like, uh, you know, when I went through the social media thing, we have a lot of friends in social media, or had a lot of friends in social media before Donald Trump. Um, you know, everybody during Obama was like, hey, yeah, we love, we're doing good stuff. And all of a sudden, Trump stuck his ugly head up. And uh, and then all of a sudden, like, you know, I don't, it seemed like a third of my friends, like all of a sudden, uh, it's like, wait, wait, I, you're a raging racist? I thought you were... <laughs> We were all doing kumbaya and I thought we were great. Everybody's yeah. hugging and holding hands, and it was uh, peace and love. And and uh, and you're a raging freaking yeah. monster. And you know, yeah. and and uh, the great and friending begin. Um, yeah. And uh, yeah, I, I mean, I lost so many friends that I had just had yeah. to. And you know, a lot of them didn't understand it. But you're like, you know, I can't, I can't have you getting stuff on me. Like you, you, yeah. you because when people. People, I, I still don't think people realize this because I have a few friends that still remain friends with people, and and it's like you don't understand when you're friends with them, you, you know, people see you and they used to go, well, that dudes are raging racist, yeah. so you must be approve them. Um, yeah, and you're giving that person permission. Yeah, 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 and it just it just unleashed this thing uh, where these people had really a deep seated racism. And it gave them permission to just come out of the racist closet and just, rah, and you're just like, yeah. holy crap, man. And yeah, uh, I, yeah. I, I think with social media, I don't mean to interrupt, but I kind of think it was like they found the people with like the little seed of racism because they like, they radicalized them too and like fed them a bunch of misinformation. This is not like, I really believe in accountability. So I'm not excusing, woe is me, I got ra- radicalized by Fox News and, and Facebook, but that happened. Right, mm. like, and the, those people ha- had a kernel of racist blue. There was something that 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 was already there, yeah. and that that darkness was nurtured and grown and amplified and permissioned, justified, 
And then it just like sort of like metastasized into this like really ugly, ugly thing. It's, yeah. it's so sad how it's happened. Fran Lebowitz had a great, the, I think she just summed it up perfectly. She said, Trump allows people to express their racism and bigotry in a way that they haven't been to in quite a while. And they yeah. really love him for that. It's like they were bottling it up yeah. and storing yeah. it. And they were like angry. And they're just like, I wish I could say what I want to say. And uh, then there's a lot of education he needs to have. Like I still bump into people that don't understand why white people can't use the N-word. Um, I learned a lot from Bill Maher when he got into like, a scuffle and uh, I think it was Ice-T came on the show and Ice-T explained it like perfectly, like he put it in a perfect box to, mm -hmm. to understand. And uh, But I still run to people that they just, there's so many of these tropes, there's so much of this crap going on, it's so interwoven into our society and it's 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 a lot of work we have to do to, to unravel it all. Yeah, yeah, yeah I mean it. It is a lot of work. I always like I so I don't want to underplay the work, but I think it, it's also so easy to get overwhelmed. You know, it's a shit ton of work, right? It's going to take us a really long time. But I also, you know, like I again, I reflect back on 2020, and at that moment, you know, it wasn't like people all of a sudden mag magically got educated on racism, but people like knew a thing was wrong. They like, just then they had the bravery to say this is a wrong thing. Like I don't understand all the ins and outs of it. I can't, you know, talk to you about, you know, theory and whatever, but I can tell you when a wrong thing's a wrong thing and that we need to stop this wrong thing. Yeah. And I think that's the thing that we have to keep pushing for. And we're like the cover it's a moving target. I'm learning about anti-racism and, and I'm black and I teach anti-racism. So mm. if I'm learning about it. I know so many other people are still learning about it. And there's still like more that we're discovering within our community. So I think you're right. There's a shit ton of work we can do, but also it starts at just a very simple place, which is like, this thing is fucked up. This thing is wrong, right? Like we got to stop this wrong thing. And I always say to, especially the white people I talk to, if you all just got together and just like provide a little bit of friction for the race, it's just made it harder for everybody. Like, like you say, like do friend people on Facebook, call it out every time you see it. It like, it, it it'll probably get solved so much quicker. Like that is what happened in 2020. It's yeah. like a bunch of white people said, you know what? This is really messed up. Like, I'm gonna, I'm gonna put on my mask. I'm gonna go out on the street with a sign, and we're just not gonna get anything done today because I'm really pissed off about racism. And then all of a sudden, all these companies and these governments were like, "Oh, wait a second. What should we be doing here?" And yeah. then they went home. And then people were like, "Uh, I guess that sign on the sidewalk was enough, right?" And so, yeah. you know, I think it's just like we have to figure out how do we sustain that friction and continue to make it hard because that will be, I think, what makes the difference. That's the biggest problem with CRT then if people fighting with CRT about CRT is we need to learn our history so that we don't that's repeat right. it. And, right. and that's what we need to do. We need to like read books like yours, educate ourselves, get to know more, get to understanding the nuances of, of it all, how, how, how just ingrained it is in our society and our history. And until we understand that, you know, we're doomed to repeat it. Yeah. And so, like you say, I think everyone needs to to learn these things. And it's a continual battle. Like, I, you yeah. know, every time I come across some sort of thing, uh, it's a lot of times in my gaming community, we game a lot with we'll you know, Call of Duty and stuff. I'll I'll run into people who are dropping the N-word or saying other things, and it has to be an education uh, session. Did the same thing a lot with Clubhouse. It was interesting, the discussions yeah. we have at Clubhouse. And it was just, you just constantly be going through people's tropes going, okay, so here's why that's bad, and yeah. here's what you have that you don't realize mr closet dude and uh closet racist dude and uh let's fix that and then you know yeah. sometimes you know usually with clubhouse everyone was pretty open at stuff and some people get it so it's great that you've written this book so that people can discuss these things and that yeah, helps I think, yeah and i think we're so you know it's a taboo right i learned how to talk about race when i was like six right and my came home from school to talk about this in the book and there was a boy who like wouldn't hold my hand because I was black. And I didn't realize I was black until that point. I just thought I looked like my mom. And um, and then, you know, I had to be told what that meant. And I had to be told how to navigate the world as a black child and later as a black woman. And I think, so for me, acknowledging blackness, acknowledging whiteness, talking about racism, it's not, it's, it's not taboo. It's not uncomfortable. It's a matter of survival. And I think, and it's a, so it's a skill I've learned. And I, and you know, my goal with the book in part and the way I wrote it, like I did is to get more people comfortable with talking about race. You know, I used to have people call me 
to come work with their companies and they couldn't even say the word race, Chris. They would be like, um, you know, Yvonne, we want to work on our internalized bias. We want to talk about sexism and gender and uh, disability and accent and neurodiversity. And r-. and they would like stop. And I would just have to like be quiet. And be like, you can say the word like race. Like it's, I'm black, by the way. You can say that. Like, it's fine. You know, and, and I think we just have to like, we have to get comfortable talking about it like the reality that it is. You know, you talk about those critical race theory bills and the one that's in Florida is like, don't have conversations that make people uncomfortable at work. What is, like, what is that even? Like, we have to get comfortable talking about it so that it seems even more ridiculous that we wouldn't, yeah. right? And that doesn't mean that we accept biases. It means that we are open about our struggles and the struggles that this country has. And we're not taking personal offense when people bring up very real stuff that's happening. So mm-hmm. I, I agree with you. We got to get educated and we got to get comfortable having these conversations because it's just the reality of the world yeah. in which we live. Yeah. And until we learn from our history, we'll learn. I, I yeah. think you nailed it the best with what you said. You know, we have to get comfortable. We have to have the hard discussions. And really, they aren't that hard once you get yeah. used to having them and you yeah. having a conversation. Hey, this is an issue. Let's fix it. Um, how do we fix it? Well, we learn more. We educate. And, you know, empathy is another big thing. Understanding each other and, uh, you know, histories and pasts and trying to do this. But, you know, it's a constant battle since... Fox News is cranking out the newest thing every day. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. there you go. Uh, it's been wonderful to have you on the show. Anything more you want to touch on or tease out about the book and what you do? Um, no, I think, you know, I, I'll just end on this note. I think it's really easy to think about anti-racism or DEI as more as a siloed issue. Mm-hmm. And I, I really strongly believe as somebody who's researched the future of work for a while, that this is the thing that we have to wrestle with as we're thinking about the future of work in our own and the future of economic opportunity, right? Like so much of this is like interwoven and if we don't get this right, there's going to be so many more downstream impacts politically, economically, et cetera. I really think that, you know, a lot of this is like the future of our country rests on it. Not to be overblown about it, but like, that's the reason why I write about it and talk about it all the time. Not just because I think it's interesting and fun, but also because I think it's really, really important. So I just Mm. encourage people to take the lessons that they can from the book. Um, If the only lesson they take is like, here's how I have an uncomfortable conversation better. That's a fantastic lesson. Take that lesson um, and and just try changing one little thing because it's like so, so, so important that we do this. We can't we're either going to go forward or we're going to go backward. There's kind of no staying where we are at this point. Yeah. And we don't, we don't need to go backward. I've been there. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. It's, it's really awful. I was talking, we had Eddie Glaude Jr. on the show. And we were talking about a James Baldwin. And I'm like, I'm like, you know, how do we make it so that we, we don't, you know, his words don't have to echo true 50 years from now or hundred years from now. Cause I don't know, but we'll be drinking if, <laughs> if, if it's still a problem. Uh, <laughs> thank you very much for coming on the show. We really appreciate it. Thank you for having me. It's been such a pleasure. There you go. Uh, and give us your plug so that people can find you on the interwebs. Oh, yes. Find me at uh, Twitter at Hachimachuch. Uh, that's my Twitter handle. Again, I apologize for its length. Um, and then I'm at Wyvon.com. Um, and also, you can check out Ready Set at www.thereadyset.co. So. There you go. Order up the books, yeah. folks. Uh, February 1st, 2022. How to talk to your boss about race, speaking up without getting shut down. Uh, guys, uh, you know, learn about what's going on. Get educated. Education is, education is empowerment, uh, not sticking your head in the sand. So get empowered and learn what the hell's going on in this world, and that way we can fix it. Uh, thanks, so much for tuning in. Go to goodreads.com, for us, Chris Foss, youtube.com, for us, Chris Foss, all the groups that we have on LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, all those different places. Thanks for tuning in. Be good to each other. Stay safe. And we'll see you guys next time.